Good morning, everybody. Welcome to one of our uh, final lectures for Physics 114. We are going to now begin uh, our study of thermodynamics. So this is going to be uh, the study of the nature of heat and ideal gases. And we're going to find here, uh, one of the big thrusts for lecture today is the idea that uh, our understanding up to this point of the nature of conservation of energy is fine and worked for all the problems that we studied, but we're going to find needs to be slightly modified uh, for our discussion of gases. And I will show you what we mean as we go through today. So big things for today are to discuss the nature of thermal energy, how that connects to uh, our standard understanding of the uh, object's temperature. We're going to develop for you the first law of thermodynamics, which is essentially going to be uh, conservation of energy for ideal gases. And then we are going to spend some time discussing the nature of ideal gases and understanding um, how they can change their state using what we refer to as PV diagrams. Now, for those of you who have studied uh, ideal gases or have seen the ideal gas law perhaps uh, in a chemistry course already, you're going to find that the discussion today is relatively familiar. There's not going to be uh, a lot of things new that you haven't seen before, but our big idea is that we're going to give you a little bit of the physicist's perspective of how we treat ideal gases, and we're going to hopefully augment uh, the discussion that you've seen in chemistry with a few extra things. All right, so here's our first idea. We want to start with the core principles that physics provides for us, which again are natures of um, forces and energy. And this should be familiar for you. We have been uh, using this expression a lot up to this point, um, talking about things within the system that present the system with certain forms of energies and how I can change those energies by doing external work. And again, external work being um, anything that I do not place as part of the system appears as an external work. Now today, um, we're really going to hit on this term Q. Up to this point, we've been ignoring it completely. We've said there's been no exchange of energy in the form of what we understand as heat. But we're going to find today, um, in fact, I'm going to give you a problem specifically on this, where if we just apply our standard uh, understanding of the work energy relationship, which is um, I change the energy of the system by doing work on that system, and work is a force applied to a system over a certain displacement, we're going to find that, that um, the application of just that idea to a specific problem is wrong. And we have to add an additional term to make this make sense. And this is going to be the Q, um, the heat term that you will see here. We'll talk about this much more in detail as we move forward. So let's start with this. We're now moving into the realm of the microscopic. And you saw this a little bit in oscillations. You're going to see this a little bit more uh, when we talk about diffusion. First of all, you may be aware uh, already of the concept of temperature, the idea that temperature in a sense is motion. It is the vibration of all these atoms and molecules as they vibrate around their equilibrium position. The mm, ferocity of that vibration gives kinetic energy, therefore provides uh, what we refer to as temperature. Make sure you distinguish this from what we understand as thermal energy. So temperature simply measures the amount of kinetic energy, the amount of vibration, um, the speed at which that vibration is occurring. Whereas thermal energy accounts for, um, yes, the vibration, but also the potential energies that are stored within all of the chemical bonds that make up uh, whatever our substance is. So just keep this in mind. Temperature is vibration, is just kinetic energy. Thermal energy is the sum of all of the kinetics plus all of the potentials. It's all of the, um, in a sense, forms of energy that are appearing at the microscopic. We're going to refer to this as thermal energy. So let's start with this. All right, with just those definitions. Here's a couple of different beakers. Um, and I'm telling you that the temperature of beaker A is less than that of beaker B. If that's the case, then how do the thermal energies compare? As usual, uh, at this point, pause this video, make sure you open the grade scope assignment, uh, give your answer there, and resume the video when you're ready. All right, so remember here that thermal energy is the sum of all the kinetic energies plus the potential energies. I can assume here that if it's the same substance, same volume, that there's about 
Now, we'll even say there is uh, the same number of molecules in both A and B, therefore they are presenting with the same amount of potential energy. But remember, temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. So if the temperature of beaker A is less, it means that the thermal energy, the uh, summation of the kinetic and the potential energies must also be less, if that's the case. All right, try this one out. Now I'm gonna give you two beakers. They have the same temperature, all right? But beaker B has a larger volume. There's more stuff in beaker B. How does the thermal energy of A now compare to B? Pause the video, give us an answer in grade scope, and return to the video when you're ready. So remember here, thermal energy is the combination of all of the vibrations, the kinetic energy, plus the potential energy that is stored in these chemical bonds. The temperature is the same, which means the kinetic energy is the same, but there's more stuff in beaker B. There are more molecules that are there. Therefore, there are more bonds that are present. Therefore, there is more thermal energy that is present because there is more potential energy in system B as compared to system A, even though the temperatures are the same. Therefore, the kinetic energies would be the same. All right. Just a reminder uh, from our previous couple of slides, remember to distinguish between these two. Temperature measures the average kinetic energy. Thermal energy measures both the kinetic energy and the potential energies as well. Now, we've talked about this a lot. You know, we've said this term uh, temperature. How do, exactly do we represent this? Again, this should be familiar, especially if you've taken uh, any sort of a chemistry class before. Um, our SI unit, this is really important uh, for this particular section, the SI unit for temperature is the Kelvin. And on the Kelvin scale, we want to say that um, if an object has no motion whatsoever, it is not vibrating at all, it carries no kinetic energy, therefore provides nothing to the temperature. Remember, kinetic energy is always positive. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Mass is always positive, and the velocity squared will always become positive. I mean, at least we haven't discovered anything yet uh, in the universe that has negative mass. I mean, if you do, uh, quite frankly, please let me know because I want in uh, on the Nobel Prize. Since that's the case, kinetic energy is always positive, so therefore the zero on the Kelvin scale is zero. You're, of course, more than likely familiar with Celsius. This is more of the uh, kind of standard, maybe everyday scale, if you will, which scales from 0 to 100 based on the freezing and boiling points of water. There's a really nice conversion. The um, step sizes between Celsius and Kelvin are the same, which means I can get from Kelvin to Celsius simply by subtracting 273. The temperature differences in the Celsius and Kelvin scale are the same, which is why uh, I am able to do this. All right, so as mentioned here, um, on the Kelvin scale, the no kinetic energy corresponds to zero Kelvin. This would be on the Celsius scale as corresponding to minus 273. There's this 273 uh, conversion factor between one and the other. Now, keep in mind that it is, um, at least as we understand, impossible to have zero Kelvin. Even the sort of ambient temperature of the universe, um, the, the background, uh, background temperature, if you will, even if you're out in space in the middle of nothing and there's nothing else around, it's not going to be zero Kelvin. Um, I'm afraid I don't remember exactly, but it's something like two or three Kelvin is the ambient temperature of the universe. All right, so in a sense that because of Brownian motion and other things, it is impossible uh, to get something down to zero Kelvin, but we at least need a limit, um, and that's why it is going to be here. You may occasionally uh, see things in Fahrenheit, but uh, that nasty scale uh, we will never see here uh, in, in this particular unit. We're going to restrict ourselves to the SI units of temperature, which are going to be Kelvin, and oftentimes we will convert back and forth to Celsius again because the step lengths between the two are the same. Now, as I mentioned previously, we've studied up to this point the nature of the work energy theorem. And the work energy theorem said, as we've seen it up to this point, I have a system that contains some certain amounts of energies. I can do work on that system to change the energy of the system. But remember, based on our understanding, work is a force applied to the system that, excuse me, causes the system to displace in some excuse me, 
displace in some manner. So let's apply this to this problem here. We're gonna find that we run into an issue. So try this out. Let's say this system here is the water. And I'm gonna heat up the water, I'm gonna place it over a burner of some kind, uh, which is gonna force the temperature to increase. Based on our understanding of the nature of work up to this point, what is the work done on the system? Pause the video, give me an answer in grade scope, and return to the video when you're ready. Now, here we must use the strictest definition of work. Work, by its very nature, is a force applied to a system that causes that system to displace, to move in some manner. I'm gonna apply that to this context to say, well, the system, the, the water uh, that is being acted on does not move. Its average, if you like, uh, location of its center of mass does not displace. Since that is the case, we are forced to the conclusion that there is zero work that is done in the system. But then you fight back very correctly and you say, but Dr. Young, wait a minute, um, the system has increased its temperature. And you told me earlier that temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. So how can I change the kinetic energy within this system and not do work on that system? And you are absolutely right. We need something else in our work energy theorem to say, how can I change the energy of some system without doing work on it? All right, this is the first law of thermodynamics. It says that I can transfer energy into or out of an environment by doing work on it. This you have seen up to this point. This is the work energy theorem we've been studying for weeks, all right? But you've also now seen, based on the previous question, that I can change the energy of some system by adding heat to that system. The previous case in the form uh, of a little burner that was applying heat to some system. So we need to now augment our understanding of the work energy theorem to say, here it is, I can change the total energy of the system by either doing work on the system or by adding heat to the system. Or you know, I really could do both at the end of the day. So here's an example. I could place this gas, this liquid, whatever the hell you want, uh, over some sort of a burner, which supplies heat to it that will change its energy. I could also uh, compress the system. I could do work on it by applying a force to it and causing its center of mass to this place that would also change its energy as well. So here we have the first law of thermodynamics. That's literally all it is. It is the conservation of energy, but now admitting that I can also change the energy of the system by adding heat to my system. All right, so now we have this more extended view of the work energy relation where once I define my system, and let's be very careful about these, the plus minus signs are really important here, all right? Doing work on the system or adding heat to it causes the energy of the system to increase, all right? If the system does work, if the, um, the gas pushes against something and forces that something to expand, work is being done by the system, all right? Or I could have that um, the system is exchanging heat. I place two objects of different temperature next to each other, and they're exchanging heat with each other. If I lose heat from the system, or if the system does work on its environment, then energy is lost from that system because it is being converted into another form, all right? Now, the most, uh, if you like, straightforward macroscopic system that we can apply the first law of thermodynamics to is going to be an ideal gas, all right? All of these ideal gases can be described by what we refer to as state variables. So if you like, um, things I need to be able to describe the totality of the behavior of these ideal gases at uh, any particular given uh, point or point in time or anything like that. And this is what we are. If I have knowledge of the pressure of some gas, its volume, its temperature, and the number of moles of the gas or the number of particles that that gas contains, I can claim that I have complete information about that ideal gas at that point. Now, the connection between these two, uh, or between, uh, excuse me, all four of these, again, you've probably seen this from chemistry before. This is known as the ideal gas law and tells us that the combination of the pressure and the volume within the gas will be the same as the combination of either the number of moles in the temperature or the number of molecules and the temperature 
given uh, some of these scaling constants, either the gas constant here, R, or the Boltzmann constant here, K. And this is something that you've probably done in a chemistry class, where you take a bunch of data from a gas and you plot um, pressure times volume versus number times temperature, and you get a beautiful straight line. The slope of that line, of course, will be uh, this extra constant, either the gas constant or the Boltzmann constant, all right? Now, remember, what we said previously, temperature, hence thermal energy, is proportional um, to these combination of things. The number of molecules that I have in my system that is vibrating times the amount of kinetic energy that they carry, which again is a proxy for temperature. All right, we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. Again, just some quick definitions um, you've hopefully seen before. That by definition, one mole of a substance will contain Avogadro's number amounts of molecules in that substance. So we can say then that the total number of moles is equivalent to the number of molecules that is present divided by Avogadro's number. This allows us to make a few substitutions in the ideal gas law. So we could write, for instance, um, that PV equals NRT is now written as the total number of molecules divided by uh, Avogadro's number. I can spin a few things around uh, and write this instead as the gas constant divided by Avogadro's number. And we're gonna roll those together and refer to it as the Boltzmann constant. By definition is the gas constant divided by Avogadro's number and takes on this value here. Again, remember, both of the expressions in terms of the number of moles or the number of molecules are completely equivalent. They are both exactly the same thing. Uh, you're just going to pick and choose whichever one that you like, depending on, uh, frankly, what the problem uh, sets you up for uh, information that you have. Now, we mentioned previously that thermal energy is the sum of potential and kinetic energies within some substance. It's mm, challenging to indicate the nature of how the potential energy comes in here. So suffice it to say that um, every degree of freedom that is present within a gas, and for the most part, we're gonna have three because our gas can oscillate um, in the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction, presents a value of one half NKT to the total amount of thermal energy that is contained within a substance. So what you need to notice here is, I can write the thermal energy in terms of the number of moles, the gas constant, and the temperature, which means any change in the thermal energy of my substance is directly related to the change in the temperature of that substance. As long as the number of moles stays the same. This is where this kind of comes from, right? Because we said previously, um, temperature is just a measure of kinetic energy. Thermal energy is a measure of both, kinetic and potential energies. So the thermal energy you see here is with respect to the change in the temperature that accounts for the kinetic. And this sort of three halves NR, this three halves NK is taking care of the potential, all right? We don't need to go down to this level of detail here, but if you want to know more of where this comes from, um, go ahead and look up um, thermal energy degrees of freedom. Um, and you can get a long-winded uh, Wikipedia article of where this um, value of three halves come from. All right, but important thing I want you to notice here, if the gas stays the same, if the number of moles that I have stays the same, such that the potential energies that are presented stays the same, then my change in thermal energy is purely due to a change in temperature of my substance. And that's really gonna help us out later when we start looking at these uh, PV diagrams. Now, a lot of the times what we're going to do is we're gonna say, I'm gonna have some ideal gas in a closed system and I'm gonna make some changes to it. I'm gonna do work on it. I'm gonna allow it to exchange heat uh, with something else or its environment. Most of the time, the gas is gonna stay the same. It's gonna stay, uh, it's gonna have the same number of moles or molecules that are continuously present. And again, if you've taken chemistry, you've seen this kind of thing before, where if I have the same gas, then this quantity, this relationship, uh, pressure times volume over temperature, will remain the same as the gas evolves from one state to the next. It's gonna help us out as we start looking at some of these um, PV diagrams, which, lo and behold, here they are. This is a lot of times how we like to view changing the nature of these state variables, changing the behavior of the states that the gas is providing to us. So notice here, I'm going to plot pressure on the y-axis, typically in kilopascals, sometimes you might see this in pascals, and volume 
on the x-axis. So any point that I put on here is going to tell me what the pressure and the volume of that particular gas is. And if you remember previously, if the number of moles in the same, uh, knowledge of the pressure and the volume also gives me knowledge of the temperature. That's what I can indicate here. So each of these points will have different pressures and volumes, and you can confirm, plug these into the ideal gas law, that they will all have different temperatures as well. Now, what we're gonna study here are different ways of getting the gas to move from one of these states to another. All right, a process that causes the state of the gas to change, as I mentioned here, is referred to as a trajectory. So we could take this gas, for instance, and force it to move, uh, to change its pressure while keeping its volume constant, then change its volume while keeping its pressure constant. Turns out that there aren't too many ways to do this. In fact, there are only about four standards that we would like you to know. And we're gonna go through each of those uh, in turn. But before we do, let's test this really quick, all right? Here's a PV diagram for you. Um, I'm gonna increase the temperature of this gas from 120 to 360, and I'm gonna do so according to this process right here, where I'm going to raise the pressure, but I'm gonna keep the volume of that gas constant. Which of the following would best represent the final pressure of this gas as I go through this process here? Pause the video, give me an answer in grade scope, return to the video when you're ready. So here you have to recognize, what is the nature of the trajectory that I am taking this gas on? So in this case, I am taking this gas from one pressure to another while keeping the volume the same. Since that's the case, I'm gonna set up an ideal gas law equation for the initial state down here. I'm gonna set an, uh, an ideal gas law equation for the final state all the way up here, but then we can claim from the trajectory that this gas is taking that the volumes are the same. Since the volume is the same, I'm gonna solve for the volume from one of these expressions, plug it into the other, and this is what I get here. All right, the number of uh, moles, the gas constant cancels, so I end up in just a ratio of the temperatures. Be careful when you're working with these ideal gas law questions. Let me go back a little bit. Remember, these constants here, the Boltzmann constant is measured in joules per Kelvin, all right? The gas constant is measured in joules per mole Kelvin. So whenever you're solving a problem like this, which deals with an ideal gas and some temperature, you must convert your temperature to Kelvin before plugging things in. I'm guessing that was the most common mistake uh, that was made if you worked through this problem uh, yourself. So don't forget, the um, constants in the ideal gas law are with respect to Kelvin. You must convert your temperature to Kelvin before plugging things in to these expressions. Now, as I mentioned, as I take a gas from one state to the next, there's really only about four different ways that I can do it. Here they are for you. I can take my gas from one state to the next, keeping the volume the same. I can keep the pressure the same. I can keep the temperature the same. Or I can say that there is no heat that is added or removed as I do so. This is called an adiabatic process. Typically, you'll find that these adiabatic processes have steeper lines um, than the isothermal processes. And let me give you an example of how each of these might work, all right? I could have a gas in a closed container that I'm heating, all right, that increases the pressure but keeps the volume the same, all right? This would be, we refer to these as isochoric processes. It would be a vertical line on the PV diagram. Pressure increases, volume is the same. And remember, the only way that this can happen, because my volume is not changing, I am not doing any work on the system. So the only way an isochoric process can happen is if you add heat to the system to increase its pressure without doing work on that system. I could keep the pressure the same, but increase the volume. But remember, if I'm increasing the volume, this means that the gas is doing work on its environment. It is losing energy. So the only way I can keep the pressure the same as the gas does work, uh, a negative work specifically, is to add heat into the system. So you'll see these constant pressure processes appear as horizontal lines on the PV diagrams. 
I can also have isothermal processes. This is a case where I do work on the gas, but I do not allow it to change its temperature. So if I don't change the thermal energy of my gas, I do work on it, as you've seen here, but that means the gas must also exchange heat. It must lose heat to its environment to be able to stay at the same temperature. These same temperature processes are referred to as isothermal. And remember, thermal energy only cares about the change in temperature that the gas experiences. So if the um, process is isothermal, that gas's temperature is the same as it moves from one state to the next. All right, since that's the case, um, I can spin the ideal gas law around a little bit. Uh, we're making these PV diagrams, um, but for these isothermal processes, everything in this top line is a constant because the temperature is remaining the same. So we get this inverse relationship uh, between pressure and volume. This is simply a hyperbola. This is a one over X kind of relationship. So you see here that these constant thermal processes will appear as hyperbolas, whereas different temperatures will appear as, if you like, different slope hyperbolas, all right, where each of these constant temperature processes we refer to as isotherms on a PV diagram. Now, to be able to understand and apply um, the nature of the first law of thermodynamics, I have to be able to calculate the change in the thermal energy, which I can do based on differences in the temperatures. I also need to be able to calculate the work done, either by the gas or on the gas. Here it is. The work done on the gas as it evolves from one state to the next is simply the area under the curve for a PV diagram. Now, if I am compressing a gas, I am doing positive work on it because I am increasing the gas's thermal energy. I'm giving it more kinetic energy. I'm forcing it to um, exist in a smaller space. All right, so therefore, so what you need to keep in mind um, to help with the science, if I'm compressing the gas, if the volume gets smaller, the work done on that gas is positive. If the gas expands, if the volume gets bigger, that gas is doing work on its environment to be able to expand. Therefore, the work done by the gas is positive. Therefore, the work done on the gas is negative. It's an easy way for it to remember. If the gas is being compressed, work done on it is positive. If the gas is expanding, the work done on it is negative. So let's try this out here. Here is an isochoric process. I am going to increase my pressure at constant volume. What is happening to the heat? What is happening to the work done on the system? Pause the video, give me an answer in grade scope, return to the video when you're ready. All right, so remember here, the work done on the gas is the area under the curve. What's the area under the curve? There is no curve, there's no area here. Um, to be taken. So this must mean that the work done on the gas is zero, but I'm increasing the pressure at constant volume. The only way I can increase the pressure of a gas and not do work on it is to add heat into the system. So for these isochoric processes, because I'm increasing the pressure, there's no area under the curve, the work done is zero, but to increase the pressure at constant volume, I must be adding heat into my system. Let's try this one. Here is an isothermal process for you. What is happening to the heat and the work? Pause the video, give me an answer in grade scope, return to the video when you're ready. Now remember, for these isothermal processes, for isothermal, the thermal energy does not change, therefore the temperature does not change. Therefore, the work and the heat added must be oppositely related to be able to keep the thermal energy change equal to zero. So what's happening here? What's happening to my gas? Um, the final volume of the gas is smaller than the initial volume. Therefore, I am compressing the gas. Therefore, I am doing positive work on the system. But to do positive work on the system, but not change the thermal energy of the system, I must be extracting heat at exactly the same rate that I am adding work. So to keep the thermal energy the same for these isothermal processes, I am doing work 
on the system because I'm compressing the system, but at the same time, I must be removing heat from the system to maintain the same temperature and to keep us on this isothermal path. All right, if you'd like a little bit of a longer winded explanation, here it is for you. Again, I'm not changing thermal. So if the work done is positive, the heat must be removed from the system. All right, a few more questions for you. Try this one out. Here's a couple of different paths. Here's a couple of different ways um, that I could take a system from initial to final. The initial state is the same. The final state is the same, but I don't know what these paths are. I'm not told they're isothermal, isochoric, uh, whatever else. So what else uh, instead can I tell? Initial is the same, final is the same, but it's two different paths. So how do the temperature changes compare? Pause the video, give me an answer in grade scope, return to the video when you're ready. Now, remember, this is one of those cool things about thermal energy, right? Thermal energy depends on your pressure and volume at any given point in the gas. So because these gases start at the same place with the same pressure and volume, and they end at the same place with the same pressure and volume, regardless of the path that I take them through, the temperature change will be the same. Because remember, thermal energy only cares about your temperature change. The temperature at any given point only cares about what your pressure and volume are at that point. If the pressure and volume is the same, for the initial states and the final states, then the temperature change is also going to be the same. But you correctly push back and you say, but these processes are different, right? So if the temperature change is the same, something has to be different, right? In fact, you are correct. Try this one out here. The temperature change is the same, but what is happening to the heat exchanged for one process versus the other? Pause the video, answer in grade scope, return when you're ready. So now we have to again appeal to the first law of thermodynamics. The change in the thermal energy is the same because the gases, the two gases start and end at the same location. So I have to check the other two terms. We have to remember that the work done on the gas is the area under the curve. So which of these two curves is going to have a larger area underneath it? Well, curve A has a larger area underneath it. Therefore, there is more work done on the gas for path A. But both paths must end up at the same temperature. So if path A is doing more work and adding more energy into the system, then path A must be removing more heat in order to get to the same final temperature. All right? Remember, my temperature change is a combination of my work and my heat. So in path A, if I am doing more work on the system, to get to the same temperature, I must be removing more heat at the same rate to be able to get to the same final location as my second process through path A. All right, that is all I have for you for today. Um, I hope this will get you jump started for uh, either today's studio or later this week, uh, whatever you're watching. Uh, we're gonna play around a little bit more with the ideal gas law and interpreting uh, some of these PV diagrams in terms of these constant pressure temperature processes. And again, understanding that the work done is the area under the curve and is positive when the gas is compressed and negative when the gas is expanded. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you look forward to uh, watching Thermodynamics 2. This is a standard semester. Or if you're in the summer session, usually we don't do Thermodynamics 2 and we're just going to jump straight into diffusion. So thank you for your attention. I hope you have a nice day today. And I will see you for another lecture.